the world. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Haris Khan. I'm a policy analyst here at the behavioral science team at the OECD. Um, and thank you all for joining both in person and online. Uh, we have a, a jam-packed hour of, of an agenda today, and uh, I'm excited to get to it. But first, um, I'd like to say uh, a, a word of thanks to our partners in New South Wales. This paper is a joint effort between us and the Department of Customer Service in New South Wales. And uh, it's a result of uh, you know, a months long partnership that I think uh, is unique and, and very fruitful for both parties. So, so I wanted to start off with that. Um, and we're excited to launch what is hopefully the first of many uh, publications on sludge and sludge reduction and its applicability to government services and processes moving forward. Um, today, we will uh, have opening remarks and then a presentation of the paper, Fixing Frictions. Uh, which will be followed by testimonials from um, members of the first International Sludge Academy from France and Brazil. Uh, and after that, we'll introduce the, the International Sludge Academy 2.0, the next version of the International Sludge Academy. And then I'm very excited to have uh, Professor Cass Sunstein here to talk us through what the future of sludge will look like and its applicability to uh, making governments more effective and, and more equitable across the world. And then we'll have uh, quick closing remarks from our colleagues in, in Australia. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, the Deputy Director of the Public Governance Directorate, Jillian Dorner, who's sitting beside me, uh, for opening remarks. Thank you very much. And uh, well, good afternoon to those of them in the room, uh, of you in the room here, but also good morning to those of you online and good evening, I presume, those coming in from Australia probably joining us quite late. So thank you very much. And um, before I start, I just wanted to uh, thank Professor Cass Sunstein for the use of the word sludge. I love it. It's a brilliant English word and it actually really effectively explains what we're talking about here. Although I did have an issue with my husband this morning. He was like, you're launching something on sludge? What are you talking about? And then I tried to explain it to a non-native English speaker and tried to think how to actually translate that into, <laughs> and I, into uh, French. And I think it's dysfonctionnement. Is that right? Friction. Friction, but it's not quite the same. Yeah, Sludge is just the, the best word. Anyway, um, so, um, oh, are we okay? On sound? Yep. This work comes out of the OECD Network for Behavioral Insights Experts in Government, um, which has really become a, an established centre of more than 100 government officials from over 50 countries um, over recent years for continued knowledge exchange and international collaboration on behavioural sciences. Through this network, we've established the first International Sludge Academy uh, just last year as a platform uh, through which our colleagues from the government of New South Wales, who we're delighted to have online, guide government officials from other countries in deploying their sludge audit method, which you're gonna hear more about. Um, we are grateful in particular to those colleagues from New South Wales um, Department of Customer Service for their exceptional contributions to this initiative and without you we wouldn't have been able to do it. As we begin today's session, let me start by acknowledging the overarching commitment that underpins this work at the OECD. Um, building trust in public institutions is a key priority for countries. Since 2021, the OECD has placed trust at the center of its Reinforcing Democracy initiative. As part of this, our work on improving the quality of public services has gained traction. The reason is actually very simple. People's experiences with government services can influence how they perceive their governments and public satisfaction with administrative and social services is an important driver of trust. So back in 2022, um, we had the findings from the first ever OECD survey on trust in public institutions. I hate to do this, but I'm gonna give you some data here that comes from 2021. Next week, we will be launching our second uh, survey. We'll just try to switch and see if it works. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Perfect. Brilliant. And, we, and now we can also see you, so it's perfect. Oh, great. <laughs> Hello. Um, so um, next week, we'll actually be publishing the second um, a survey uh, on drivers of trust in public institutions. So we've got some more up to date data, but unfortunately, it's under embargo. So I'm going to have to give you the 2021 data, but please do join us next week for the launch of the survey. Um, the results essentially revealed that people's interactions with public services profoundly shaped their perceptions of government responsiveness and reliability. 
less than four in 10 respondents believe that complaining about a poorly performing service would lead to improvement. And I can say that the results are similar this time around. Um, so it actually reaffirms the need to uh, pay attention to those daily interactions between citizens and public institutions, because if we do not have that trust, it is very difficult to implement the policy reforms that government have planned and want to move forward. And particularly, this is important in the context of some of today's complex global challenges. So I said sludge is a great word. Um, I'm gonna say a little bit about what it actually means in practice. We've said frictions. So it's those unnecessary frictions that block access, impose psychological costs and erode trust when we're engaging with a public um, service and it remains a pervasive barrier um, to many of us, let's face it, um, in uh, accessing government services and processes. I'm sure all of you have many examples, particularly those of you that live here in France of bureaucratic processes that have kind of got in the way of you being able to access something that you needed urgently. Um, my example would be uh, probably now about 10 years ago, trying to get a passport from the UK government was nigh on impossible. And I was on the phone. I, I, it was for my daughter who was like weeks old. So I was super stressed. Um, and uh, it had a huge impact on my mental well-being. Now, when I go and apply for my passport from the UK government, my goodness, it is so easy. And the difference is immense. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean I have more trust in my national government today, uh, but it does mean, and this is what our survey shows, that I actually have more trust in our civil service um, uh, who are actually delivering a lot of these services. So, um, the term sludge is relatively new, um, but this burden certainly isn't. Um, the concept puts a behavioural lens on a conversation that has previously been focused on administrative burdens. On the one hand, many of you will have heard of administrative simplification um, or on user experience on the other. Take, for instance, the work that the OECD has carried out on regulatory offsetting or on how to improve service delivery more broadly. Now, if we are to focus on specific human behaviors and the drivers and barriers to those behaviors, this helps us to bring those perspectives together by identifying where the problems are, quantifying them and offering pragmatic solutions. Um, this isn't, and I should be very clear here, just about administrative efficiency. And that's really actually largely what this area of research has focused on um, and support and government agendas have focused on um, over the past few decades. This is really about reshaping public services to be more equitable, accessible and trusted. The approach not only enhances government responses, responsiveness, but also bolsters trust, particularly, and this is another key part of this, among vulnerable populations who are most reliant on public services and are most likely to suffer psychological burdens. With this in mind, we need tools and methods to identify and address the frictions in government services and processes that are affecting the people that use them. Sludge and sludge audits are a welcome addition to this toolkit, uh, and it's clear that there is a need to mainstream them uh, across public administrations. Through this policy paper that we're launching today, we're proud to have facilitated the first international applications of the SLUD audit method, um, which you'll see there's the report on the screen. Um, the paper not only presents the New South Wales methodology, but also showcases 10 case studies of sludge reduction in governments around the world. So you can see where this is starting to have impact. While this work has taken a significant step forward, there's much more to be done in improving public services to ensure that they deliver for people. So this is one part of the solution to this problem. Um, we are very much committed here uh, in the OECD to leading uh, in this very exciting field, an important field. Um, we're developing uh, currently, and hopefully this will go to our governing body, the OECD Council, um, after the summer, an OECD recommendation, that's an international standard, on human-centred public administrative services. The recommendation is currently open for public consultation until the 7th of July, and I encourage all of you um, to take a look at it and provide your comments and insights. 
This recommendation sets a clear common policy framework to support governments in the development and implementation of administrative services that put people at the center of design and delivery. Again, this is not just about efficiency. This is about making services work for people. Our plan is to launch this new recommendation at the second global forum on building trust and reinforcing democracy taking place in Milan on the 21st and 22nd of October this year. Um, and I invite you to engage fully in today's session, which will start with a presentation from OECD colleagues um, uh, and from the Government of New South Wales colleagues, followed by a keynote intervention by Professor Cass Sunstein, which I'm very much looking forward to, who is the author of the book Sludge, which I have in my hand here, um, and whose seminal work has really shaped this field. So with that, I'm going to pass the floor back to Chiara. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gillian, for these great opening remarks. Just checking that uh, you can hear me online. It's in yes, the... yes, perfectly. Thank you, Mariam, for being our <laughs> online. <chef. laughs> um, so thank you so much, Gillian, for these great opening remarks. Uh, what I would like to do now is going a little bit more in depth and telling you uh, to tell you a little bit about the work that we have done with the first International Stage Academy. And this was, as Harris and Gillian put it out, a collaboration between the OECD and the New South Wales um, government in Australia. Um, and we're very lucky today to have um, Eva Kouromilas joining us from Sydney. Uh, she's the manager of the Bishop Insights Unit in the New South Wales Department of Customer Service. Uh, Eva, she's also the mastermind behind the uh, sludge audits methodologies. So we are very, very honored to have her with us. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Harris Khan, uh, policy analyst and project lead in the OECD behavioral science team. So Gillian spoke a little bit about what sludge is. Um, and <clears throat> I'm sure that many of you have heard the term nudge in the past. Uh, so nudge refers to improvement to the choice architecture that make it easier in general for people to access and use public services in this case. While sludge, we like to say that it's a little bit like the bad brother of uh, nudge. So there, these are all the unjustified frictions that really make it harder to access and use public services. So this is the definition that we give in the book and it's very much aligned with uh, what Kassenstein wrote in his book. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention uh, is that government um, sludge in government tend to be unintentional very often. It's not like public servants wake up every day wanted to add frictions to public services. So typical examples of sludge in public services include information that is hard to find, processes that are hard to understand or complete, very long waiting times without uh, being updated. And we know that humans don't like to, to be idle and not uh, having updates, but also complex decision points. So as you can see, uh, a lot of the assumptions of our work on this is that much of this uh, sludge in government and public services is actually not intentional. And one thing that I wanted to share with you um, is that one added value of talking about sludge and not only about administrative burden is really that this puts an emphasis on what we call psychological cost. And so you will see in the paper, we, make, we made an attempt to better define what are these psychological costs. Because as, as Gillian mentioned, these are all intuitive concepts. We get, we're frustrated, et cetera, but it's very difficult to measure them. So really, the, the, the core of this work is to try to identify and uh, start to quantify what are psychological costs. And the first step is to talk about the categorization of psychological costs. So we can talk about search costs that occur when people are searching for information that is very hard to find. I'm sure you can have an example of that. Uh, we have also decision costs, which are a little bit different. We know that uh, people uh, experience psychological costs when they're asked to evaluate options, especially when options are very close to each other. And this has a cost in terms of psychological uh, overload. But also we have more cognitive costs. So the mental resources that we're asked to spend in fulfilling requirements or understanding uh, very complex information. And so I have a background in neuroscience as uh, plenty of other people in the behavioral science community. And with this cognitive cost, we're really refer referring to the brain capital that we are asked to use every day 
to overcome uh, what is unclear um, information. And the last type of cost that we mentioned in the paper is emotional cost, which I'm sure is something that comes to mind. Uh, this includes incurring and country stigma, uh, experiencing a loss of autonomy, but also feeling stressed, uh, disempowered, anxious, or frustrated. And so let me just say something that I think is very important, which is that all the psychological costs uh, impact enormously vulnerable people. And what I mean by vulnerable people is not only vulnerable groups, but um, people at different times of their life, we are all vulnerable at times. Well, Gideon mentioned the passport experience, but I'm sure that plenty of you uh, had experience of being vulnerable when you experience, unfortunately, bad things like that or uh, natural disasters or when you're giving birth as well. Sometimes it can be hard. Um, so we are all vulnerable at times and really sludge is, has the highest impact when we are experiencing vulnerable, when we, are, when we are the most vulnerable. So this is a little bit unexplored territory. Um, so given that psychological costs are incredibly hard to, uh, to think about and to measure, we also needed new tools. And that's when we started a partnership with New South Wales. And so now we'd like to pass the floors to Eva to tell us more about uh, the New South Wales sludge audit methodology. Over to you, Eva. Thank you so much, Chiara. <clears throat> and thank you, Harris and Pradnaya and Gillian. We're so excited for this partnership and what we've been able to create together, which would never have been possible without you. Um, so the New South Wales Sludge Audit Method has been around for four years now. And I wanted to start by giving a little bit of background on sludge audits and what makes them unique and important. Uh, back in 2019, my team was inspired by uh, Cass Sunstein, who um, many of you will know has written prolifically about sludge and was the first to conceptualise this idea of doing a sludge audit. And we're lucky to hear from sludge a bit later um, in the session today. Um, sorry, from, from Cass, sorry, um, a bit later in the session today. Um, I work in a department that is really committed to improving the customer experience. And I was curious to see what a sludge audit could look like and particularly um, what is the value add that behavioural science could bring to that. And um, as Gillian was saying, we already have other methods and frameworks that practitioners use. We don't want to duplicate those. We want to shine a light on those psychological aspects of burden and contribute something that only um, a behavioural perspective can bring. And so I do a lot of research with practitioners who are already working in this space to understand those opportunities and the gaps. And there were three things that really stood out from um, those conversations and that research. And one is that, that we have this wealth of evidence from behavioural science that just wasn't really being used in service improvement in a systematic way and not in a form that was really accessible to service owners. Um, There's also a lot of great work that was being done in eliciting customer feedback, uh, but often that was the only input that service owners were relying on to really be able to identify what needed to be fixed in a process. So we saw Sludge Audit as an opportunity to bring together that objective evidence from behavioural science alongside customer feedback so that, that behavioural lens could be embedded into service improvement. The second thing uh, we saw was that quantification was missing. There was a lot of great qualitative work that was being done to understand the customer experience, but it was hard to communicate. And, and we, we talk about things like, you know, pain points, and, uh, but it's often hard to translate pain points into that case for change. So I wanted to see if we could really isolate and quantify the different aspects of sludge that we were seeing, and particularly quantifying those psychological costs that Carol was referring to and the equity aspects and other psychological drivers that are really harder to put a number value onto. Um, finally, we wanted to see how we could make sludge reduction easier to do. Uh, sometimes, you know, people will do their customer research, they get all these results, and it's just so overwhelming. So looking at, you know, how we, can we really apply a data-driven way of prioritising what you're going to fix and how, and having guidance on how to do that was really important, but also a way to measure impact so you know that you've made a difference. And I think that's really three key things that are, uh, uh, that are, that are unique to this, this behavioural approach. On the next slide, we have the seven steps of the New South Wales Sludge Audit Method. Um, our method's been tested on almost 100 audits now. We've had a huge impact on a range of services in New South Wales. Uh, it was the method that was used by the International Sludge Academy participants that Kiara is going to talk to us a bit more about in a moment. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the seven steps of the method, but really just want to point out that there's four metrics that we particularly care about when we're doing a sludge audit, and they are uh, the metrics of time, cost, effort and inclusion. And what is most unique about our method is particularly that effort and, and inclusion component where we've really codified that behavioural science evidence I was referring to earlier. 
On the next slide, you'll see our sludge audit toolkit. Um, all the sludge audits that were done by the International Sludge Academy participants were in the Sludge Finder web tool, uh, and there were a number of other resources that participants had access to as well. Uh, so now I'm going to hand back to Chiara, who's going to tell us more about the Sludge Academy. Thank you so much, Eva. I encourage all of you to have a look at these, at these resources. Um, and when we started this first International Sludge Academy, uh, this methodology uh, was used only in Australia. So for the very first time, we decided to get it with New South Wales to pilot it, to pilot this outside of the Australian borders. And as you can see on the map, uh, we received a lot of interest. So let me tell you a little bit more about what happened. So this uh, journey started more or less uh, a little bit more than one year ago at the um, meeting of the OECD network of vehicle and sites experts in government here in Paris, where we launched uh, the, uh, this initiative. And we have 22 countries that, who asked to uh, join the International Sludge Academy. And then together with New South Wales, we selected 16 teams from 14 countries to really conduct sludge audits in parallel. And countries attended master classes on the New South Wales sludge audit method, so a much longer version of what you just had. Uh, but also, uh, they were coached with one on one mentorship and coaching. Uh, so, the New South Wales colleagues were incredibly generous with their time. And then, teams reviewed the results uh, and then began to develop and implement solutions over this time. And finally, teams all uh, across this, this time, they shared learnings and reflected on the, the results of these large audits. Now, I don't want you to, to tell you exactly all, the whole story, but let me tell you that uh, what we found is that governments around the world really wanted to reduce sludge. Um, and these 16 governments selected a very diverse range of processes and public services to audit. Um, so just to give a sense of like the, uh, the diversity of things, I don't want to go through all of that, but let me tell you that we had a nice mix of uh, public, like citizen facing public services. So we will hear uh, very soon from Brazil um, and France, uh, but we also had uh, a nice selections of internal government processes. So um, governments like Canada um, and even Australia, the federal level, they looked at HR services and how hard is it, it is to uh, get people on board uh, when you're working in, in government in terms of recruiting. And so this, just to give it a sense, this International Sludge Academy was the first one. And yes, it was uh, good geographically. So we tested this outside of the Australian borders, but also we pushed the boundaries on applying this not only on public services, but also on internal processes. So that was a nice experiment. Um, and with this, I will hand back over to uh, Eva to tell us a little bit more about the lesson learns and the nine good practice principles that we derive to assess and prevent sludge. Thanks, Chiara. So from that International Sludge Academy, we learned so much and uh, we identified nine principles that we think are really important to support governments who are doing sludge audits. And these nine principles are all covered in the paper, but I'm going to give you a quick overview of some of them now. So the first area is around deciding whether to do a sludge audit. So one of the factors that's really relevant here is how much control you're going to have over changing the process or implementing the solution to, uh, to the sludge that you've identified. We saw some good examples in the academy teams um, of teams who were able to distinguish between the aspects of the process that were controllable by the team versus those that required more systemic changes. And one of our mantras is, you know, we haven't succeeded until a person's experience has been changed. And what that really means is that you want to have a really good line of sight between the sludge audit and the implementation of the solutions arising from that. Uh, and uh, and if unless you've got that, it, it might be, you know, you might need to explore other ways to be able to, to tackle the problem or narrow the scope. Um, the only exception to that could be when you're doing a business case for change. For example, we had a side audit recently where the audit found that 20% of registrations were being done incorrectly and that those 20% were driving 80% of the calls to rectify it. So just having that data was really compelling to making the case for change. And so sometimes um, that might be the reason that you'll do the sludge audit. Um, the next uh, um, principles relate to having a method to doing an audit. And what we heard from the International Sludge Academy teams is that having a predefined common methodology that had been tested in different contexts had a lot of benefits. Uh, it meant that 
it was more rigorous. You had something that had um, been been tested uh, in, and validated ac across different processes. So you knew that it was going to be more, more reliable when you applied it to your process. Also something that was able to be replicated. So it allowed you to be able to do comparisons across time um, and also in different contexts. So we could do an audit, for example, on a license program in France and then compare that with a license program in, in Brazil. Um, the next set of principles relate to tailoring your audit to your context. And one of the things that the Sludge Academy participants did really well was accommodating for things like really complicated um, behavioural journeys. And we know that a lot of government services are, are non-linear in nature, which means that people can be undertaking multiple stages of a process at the same time. Like they might be submitting a form and then partway through the form, they're making a phone call to ask a question and then they're submitting the form and it might be incomplete and then it gets rejected. And, it can, and there's, all these, there's all these complicated uh, and, and, um, and, 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 and multiple steps that, that might occur between phases that the Make journey mapping more difficult and it was really great to see how other teams were responding to that challenge for example we saw the Finnish team who um, did multiple audits to cater for the different customers that were using their service which was which was really great um, our team um, also used a lot of feedback from the Sludge Academy to improve our journey mapping tool in our Sludge Finder um, um, tool so it has extra functionality now to cater for non-linear journeys and different pathways that users can take Another really important principle in, in this bracket is the importance of deploying an equity lens throughout the sludge audit process. Uh, we all know that um, sludge disproportionately affects underserved communities, as Kara was saying earlier. So you want to think about how you're going to approach that in your sludge audit, and it might mean that you'll choose to focus your audit purely on the experience of that underserved community, which might only make up you know, 5% of your customers, but they are your priority. And that's why you might choose to focus on them rather than the 90% that might be taking the most common path, for example. The next two principles relate to evaluating progress. And as we were um, saying at the start, the real value of the SUD audit is when it translates into the changes on the ground. And it was great to see the SUD Academy teams making use of behavioural frameworks to improve their services. And also seeing teams who are really committed to re-auditing their services so they can measure the impact of the changes that they made. And uh, the final principle relates to thinking more broadly about the system enablers you need to have a successful sludge prevention program. And some of the enablers that we identified was uh, firstly, having a government that is already um, committed to improving user services, that's obviously gonna make it easier for you to, to get that buy-in. Uh, we also found that teams that had a closer connection to service owners sometimes found it easier to be able to do their sludge audit. There's always that sort of um, trade-off between being a very sort of centralised team that might not be um, interfacing very closely to the service owners. Uh, might mean that they get more buy-in to be able to do the audit or there's more, um, more of a mandate to do that audit, but they might struggle to get access to data, for example. So we found that depending on where you were um, in, in, in government, that, that could impact um, how how successful the sludge audit was going to be. Uh, the other thing that was helpful uh, was having customer survey data that you can draw from and governments that are doing that systematically, so having a mechanism where they're just constantly getting feedback from the customer is, is ideal um, and, and something that, that, um, that we, we encourage uh, service owners to work towards. Finally, I want to quickly touch on future directions, which are covered in the paper. Uh, what we learned through um, the International Sudge Academy and collaboration with our partners like Cass Sunstein uh, is that while we're seeing a huge surge in take up of sludge audits, which is fantastic, um, there's always going to be more work that needs to be done in the area of sludge reduction. So in the paper, we've set out some of the areas that we are exploring further. And I won't go into all of these, but I'll touch on the first one, um, which is about the benefit of doing international comparisons. And we're so lucky to have an international international organisation like the OECD leading this work because it means that we can all collectively leverage so much from these international partnerships that we've formed through the Sludge Academy. Uh, we can do things like compare findings in similar processes across jurisdictions. We can learn from each other and we can use that to continue building our evidence base and understanding of global best practice, which is the thing that, that really excites me the most. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand over to Harris. Thank you, Eva and Kiara, for that fantastic presentation. Uh, and now, I think uh, one of the most exciting parts of, of today's uh, session is to hear from members of the International Sudge Academy themselves. Uh, today, we have Dr. Mariam Shamat and Dr. Antonio Claret from France and Brazil, respectively, who will walk us through uh, what they found in their sludge audits and how they're using those sludge audits to uh, create change that's impacting uh, citizens of their, their countries. So without further ado, first up, I believe we have uh, Mariam. 
Thank you very much, Harris, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you uh, the process that we uh, that we worked on during this Lodge Academy, which was extremely interesting. Uh, so I'm representing uh, my colleagues Anne Sophie, who's uh, who's in the audience. Shout out to her and Camille, who are the uh, the colleagues that actually did uh, the, the academy. Uh, so maybe just to give you a bit of context, um, at the French Behavioral Insights team, we, we used to work, um, we used to have a lot of work on simplification. Um, we simplify a lot of letters, a lot of uh, administrative um, information in general, and, and we also launched a couple of years ago a panel um, where around 8,000 citizens volunteer to, um, to be consulted once a month to give us their feedback on uh, letters or other processes that we simplify. So this work had, had already been kind of there, the, the simplification work, but we it wasn't um, methodic. We, di we didn't have this process that took us through the work. It, we did it a bit differently. And so the Sludge Academy gave us the opportunity to test um, very interesting tools and take this simplification work even further. So if you look at the next slide, uh, Harris, with, um, to give you a bit more information about the uh, application process we worked on, um, it was the APA, the Assistance for Independent Living, uh, which is basically a letter that um, elderly people can, uh, sorry, um, a process that elderly people can uh, fill in to benefit from special aid to help them stay at home. And so the administration that uh, asked us to work on this pro uh, um, process told us that one of the problems was that there was breakouts uh, at different uh, stages during the application process. And so the elderly people um, at some point stopped the application because they didn't know how to uh, take all the actions and go through the whole process. And so they wanted our help to simplify this, uh, this all this complexity, but also uh, to work on unifying these letters that have very different versions according to different territories in France. Uh, so we found this to be a very good candidate for the for the Sludge Academy uh, work because it's uh, first of all it touches vulnerable people who can benefit from an aid that they're not benefiting from because of all this complexity and it also helped us uh, show the administration that we worked with how systematically using these tools from the Sludge audits can really benefit and um, help them put themselves at the place of the users. Uh, so if you look at the next slide, uh, Harris, what, um, just to give you an idea of what we did during the Sludge audit, um, it was a lot of work. Uh, we uh, interviewed 20 different uh, people in nine different departments, uh, very different types of people, the caregivers, but applica the applicants themselves, pe people from the departmental uh, councils. Uh, we also spoke to different professionals that are from the support services. And so it gave us really an overview of all the complexities of the process, but also how each actor viewed the process from their own angle. Uh, we also did a lot of uh, review of the existing forms and went um, by interviewing the applicants, went step by step with them through everything they had to do at each step of the process, all the letters they had to gather, how much time it took for them, uh, what they also felt at, at each stage, the frustration they felt maybe, or at what at which stages they abandoned the process. So it was it was really beneficial to do all these steps and to really show the administration that um, kind of is behind this aid. How, um, what it generates in terms of uh, really from the user's point of view. Um, so all of this uh, sludge audit process informed us, and if you, yeah, if you can take the, the, the next slide. Uh, thank you, Harris. It, um, it really helped us um, prioritize really the most problematic areas. Uh, and this prioritization, I think, is really important because when you want to simplify such a complex letter, you can you can say, okay, I'm going to simplify the language, but actually, no, what the sludge audit tool helped us do is to say, it's not only about language, it's also some processes are, mm, are creating maybe inequality or are creating extremely complex st steps for these specific users, and it helped prioritize where to um, um, Put, concentrate all the efforts. So maybe to finish off, uh, to say that the four important takeaways from this process was the fact that uh, it was really very user-centric and allowed the administration to put themselves at the user's place. Uh, it allowed a, a very objective um, analysis of what complexities, uh, where the complexities were and uh, where we could gain time for the user. It was very multidimensional. That's extremely interesting. Also, uh, it included uh, insights on, on the psychological cost, on the uh, issues around inclusion. Um, it, 
it, it helped us really think about the, the 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 process from very different angles. And it and what's really beneficial also is that uh, people can autonomously do the diagnosis. And this was very interesting for the um, the administration that saw that they could actually do this and replicate it on their own. The only two perhaps complicated things uh, that the, that were uh, we felt from the the whole process was the fact that uh, there wasn't a lot of objective data. So we had to actually uh, go and find those information and took a lot of time to really understand the whole process and um, because we're not familiar with it. So uh, I think that if the person who does these large audits in the future is a person who actually knows the process very well, that's where they can gain time. Um, and also one thing we're discussing right now at in our structure at DTP is whether the, it, mm, there could be a full-time position of someone who does these sludge audits or whether, or whether it's more interesting to train different administrations so that they can do it on, our, on their own. And also what disciplines uh, you should have in such a team, design disciplines or maybe people who work on simplification, but also behavioral insights. So all these discussions are currently ongoing and we can talk about them later in the, in the discussion. But I'll hand back over to Harris um, and thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to assist uh, in the first session and perhaps maybe now in the second one. Thanks, Harris. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mariam, for that fantastic presentation. I think it links really clearly with what something something both Julian and Kara mentioned about, you know, vulnerable people and moments of vulnerability and making sure that we're uh, designing government services for those for those moments. Um, next up, we have Clarette uh, from, from the um, Ministry of Management and Innovation and Public Services of Brazil. Uh, Clarette, the, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for this uh, invitation. And thanks for the opportunity to participate in the Zelaya Academy. It was really a great experience. And that's what I'd like to thank uh, New South Wales government, uh, everybody there, Dave, Eva, but especially Alex, that has been our mentor through all of this process. And for our ECD to, to get in, all of us together in this challenger, challenging uh, endeavor, that was the first International Academy. We in Brazil uh, selected uh, uh, as our uh, process to be audited, uh, the recovery of gov.br account. That is the main uh, entrance to more than 4,000 services, digital services in Brazil. And what we learned uh, throughout the process is, is that although it's quite well uh, designed for a, a group of people uh, that cannot do the, the, natural, the, the normal way of, of recovering the, the account that is an automa automated uh, recovering process with digital and, and a facial recognition uh, 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 way of, of recovering, uh, uh, these people must go to a very uh, uh, difficult process, uh, more, more costly process, that is the recovery through online forms. And this, um, it's a huge process. We are talking about 150 million people that uses this uh, portal uh, per year. And uh, we have more than uh, 100 million requests of recovery per year. All of, of this 106 million, 3% goes to online forms. So we are looking to the people who uh, probably is most vulnerable and have more difficulty to use the digital services. Uh, next slide, please. So what we are doing uh, since what we learned with the uh, Zelage Academy, we are developing our own uh, tool and it was very important uh, to recognize that the, the, the method, the systematic approach to this process and the, 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 uh, the importance of having a, a, a tool to uh, guide us throughout this process. And as we, uh, in Brazil, as, we, uh, as you know, our language is Portuguese, so we have to adapt uh, a new tool to uh, be more use, uh, usable for our public. So we are now developing uh, the, the, a, a, a methodology that we have already uh, established the main uh, steps of this methodology. And we are now looking uh, into details of each uh, uh, device we could use to pass through each one of these uh, stages of methodology. Uh, on the next slide, please, uh, we can see this, um, uh, one of some of these uh, prototypes that we are developing. We have a prototype for phase one, that is to understand the context and then to how map uh, uh, in the phase two, the, the user's journey. And one thing that has been said by Eva that's very important is to recognize that different groups of citizens 
have different journeys. And that's what we want to uh, introduce in our uh, tool also, that is uh, to recognize these differences. And this will be like an equity check. We can see uh, uh, which people need uh, more guidance in certain uh, parts of the process to avoid sludges in this process. And we are now inter uh, testing uh, some of these uh, 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 prototypes and iterating it. And our idea is to scale up uh, in the near future. And for that, we have to design homepage, templates, guides, tutorials, uh, uh, being inspired by new software's wonderful work uh, to make this uh, tool more, more easily use it, useful for the uh, agents, the public agents that are working with the population in the local level too. And this that's why we are, we, our intention is to develop a self-applied tool uh, that can be uh, used not only by us in the federal government, but with our uh, support, maybe use it also by governments in the local level, like our states and our, and our more than 5,500 municipalities all over the country. And uh, in the next slide, please, just to, to think about some uh, lines uh, of developing in the future. Uh, we, for us, it was very clear that sludge out is a good entry point for BI in governments. So it's easy to communicate what we want to do to reduce barriers, to present results. Um, another point is that sludge out itself should be designed to avoid sludge. Sometimes when we are developing a tool, we want to put everything there and, and it may be uh, it cause barriers also for the use. So uh, as a, a practical example, our first uh, questionnaire about uh, the context have more than 40 questions and now we reduce it it's to 18. It, it is much easier to do. So uh, we also could uh, think about a, a better label for sludge audits. Audits in Brazil is not so well received for, uh, for uh, managers, sometimes have a, a not so good uh, uh, connotation. And also sludge is a little difficult to communicate in our context. We are trying to work in a more positive frame to communicate our goal to the sludge. And finally, uh, in addition to uh, efficiency gains, as we have already said before, uh, we think sludge reduction as a crucial way to promote inclusiveness, equity, and the public, public perception of services all over the world. So thank you very much for this opportunity. And also I'd like to, to uh, finally thanks, uh, thank for Professor Cass Sunstein for all the inspiration has been done for us in so many domains, specifically now in zoology reductions. Thanks so much. Fantastic, thank you. Thank you, Corette. Uh, it's it's great to see that, you know, Brazil is making their own sludge audit method and, and you know, really mainstreaming the work in, in their context. Before we get to Professor Sunstein, which is uh, which will be very shortly, I just want to talk about our plans for a potential second International Sludge Academy. Um, after the success of the first one, we've learned a couple of things. First is that different teams have different needs. There are some teams, kind of like Clarets, who are able to conduct sludge audits independently and and you know um, and don't need the mentorship that was involved in the first International Sludge Academy. And for them, we're thinking about having a diverse set of activities and, and you know, opportunities for, for knowledge sharing and methodological development. Uh, we also recognize that the sludge audit method has room to grow. It's relatively new. There's, there's plenty of opportunity for further development of the method itself. And we want to help uh, you know, bring that along. And then lastly, we see that there's value for, for sludge audits outside of just behavioral science teams. Um, you know, program program teams, policy delivery teams, and service delivery teams can also benefit from from this kind of work. And so, in the next edition of the International Sludge Academy, we hope to open it up to a broader set of of teams. Very quickly, I'll talk about what we plan on including. Um, it, most of it ha was included in the first International Sludge Academy that Kiara mentioned. So we'll talk about what the method brings to the table. But we would like to really emphasize the peer learning aspect in the next International Sludge Academy because now. There's increasingly a community of teams who are doing this together. I think there's a there's a great opportunity for teams to learn from each other and help advance uh, the methodology and um, advance their own work by sharing knowledge between each other. The OECD, of course, has a role to play in publications um, and doing research and making sure that we're able to 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 you know collate the the knowledge that's being created by um, by the community and and present it in both the publication and in the case study format and also invite experts and help uh, teams learn from members of communities outside of behavioral science. So customer experience, data science, other kinds of, uh, you know, 
knowledge areas that are useful for this kind of work. And then finally, um, as as people mentioned before, I think there's a role to play on benchmarking and making sure that you know we can bring countries together to look at processes that we all share. So passport renewal, I think, is a fantastic one, uh, and see you know where this logic exists and and do a bit of a comparative analysis between countries just to see you know who's doing better and and where the opportunities are for for further improvement. Uh, we are currently in development of the International Such Academy, so there will be a, a launch of that uh, hopefully very soon in the fall. Um, and we'll be in touch with with more information when we when we have it. But we want to to kind of present where we are at the moment and and uh, and share that with you. So with that, um, I would like to introduce Professor Cass Sunstein, who is, as we've all mentioned, a thought leader in this space. And uh, and without you know his work, I don't think uh, you know this meeting would have happened and this work would have been done. So we're very excited to have him here. Uh, he is the author of Sludge, What Stops Us From Getting Things Done and What to Do About It. And he's also the Robert Walmsley Professor at Harvard University, where he's the founder and director of the program on behavioral economics and public policy at Harvard Law School. With that, I turn it over to Professor Sunstein. Thank you so much. It's a complete honor and thrill to be here. The work being done at OECD, uh, standing ovation to Kiara and others, is uh, inspiring and thrilling. Uh, the leadership of New South Wales government and Eva is completely fantastic. Uh, standing ovation to her and team as well. And um, it's uh, an honor and a joy to be able to get to talk to you all. Uh, I wanna say, give you three stories. They're actually true stories about sludge. Um, the first is, about a person in Washington, D.C., who's actually not an American, but kind of a personage in Washington, someone of some um, uh, fame and uh, broadly admired, who called me a number of weeks ago and said that she had a problem that uh, her son needed help from the immigration system to leave the United States to attend to uh, a very sick grandparent and come back. The question was, could I help uh, navigate the immigration process? I do have a connection with the Department of Homeland Security, but on ethics grounds, the answer is clear. I could not help. And her response to my um, insistence on the ethical constraints was not joyful. She responded, uh, can't you really help? This is an urgent situation. This is my son and this is an ill family member and uh, we need help. So I called my colleagues at the government and the response was uh, the ethical constraint is firm and you can't do anything to help. And I completely got that and communicated it to her. Our, her response to me was, um, uh, agitated. She said, what, what can I do? Uh, what can I do? This is urgent. And I used three words that I've used rarely, um, but seemed to be suited to the situation, which were, were find a lawyer. Uh, she did find a lawyer and she called me 24 hours later and said the lawyer solved the problem immediately. He knew how to navigate the system. Uh, but this is a wonderful person whose personal uh, satisfaction was outweighed by uh, concern about the system. She said, what about people who don't know how to hire lawyers? What about people who don't know to talk to someone who will tell them to hire lawyers? Uh, the sludge in this context is a source of uh, a sense of uh, indignity to people and also a sense, a uh, source of significant welfare losses. Uh, the second story is a happier story. Uh, there are poor children, speaking of equity, whose families have to navigate a system of sludge to get free school meals to which they are entitled. And these free school meals can be transformative. Uh, the fact that the parents have to navigate sludge is often experienced as a wall between poor children and free school meals. Uh, the policy solution after a really little sludge audit was basically to say, if the school knows the children are poor, they don't have to navigate sludge at all. They receive the meals uh, immediately like that. And the solution called direct certification, which was sludge elimination, is producing free school meals for at last count uh, over 10 million children. 
And while it's hard to describe a reform that is a policy reform uh, in, a, in a way that introduces tears, this one is a candidate for that. That's 10 million uh, children. Uh, the third story is also a happy story. It involves the fact that in my country, as in many countries, immigration is a contested issue, uh, but there are workers who are in nations, France, Italy, the United States, Canada, lawfully, who are desperately dependent on their uh, access to the country, and they're lawfully here, and who, who are employed by companies who need those workers. They really need them to get the economic system uh, moving. Um, we have a system where workers have had to renew every 180 days to get authorization. And that poses serious difficulties for vulnerable workers. They have to get navigate sludge every 180 days. And for their employers who are at risk of losing those workers after 180 days. Question is, what can be done about this? Uh, the solution is really simple, which is to change the number 180 to the number 540. That is cutting sludge in uh by a very significant percentage, meaning you don't have to navigate it much. And the result of Paul, that policy reform, which you can find online, was to produce uh, something like dancing in the streets by employers who said, we don't have to worry about losing workers, and to produce something like a sigh of relief on the part of a very large number of workers who thought we don't have to navigate sludge every 180 days, Life is just going to be much more dignified and easy for us. Okay, a little behavioral science on the horror that is sludge. The reason that the association between the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the sludge audit process is uh, a little adventurous, but real. Uh, the first is that if people were perfectly rational, if we didn't have any need for behavioral science, sludge would still be a problem. The person I've started these remarks with is really, really rational, and she just couldn't figure it out. The fact is that we know that human beings suffer and sometimes benefit from uh, boundary rationality. And that can be a particularly poignant problem in the context of sludge. If people are suffering from unrealistic optimism, as people typically do, uh, there's a possibility that people will not be able to see the challenge that sludge actually presents. If people procrastinate, that is to say they will delay their uh, uh, sludge responsibilities, then it may be that time for navigating sludge will actually never come in actual life. If it is also the case, people are focused very much on today and tomorrow, and the present is uh, much more salient than the future, then sludge will be a terrible hardship for everyone, particularly for people for whom the tyranny of the immediate is an overwhelming problem. Unrealistic optimism procrastination and um, and, and uh, present bias are the uh, three uh, evildoers uh, for humanity with respect to sludge. And that means that the need for sludge audits is particularly insistent. We know also that if people are elderly or sick or poor or really or struggling with something or another, the problem of cognitive scarcity will mean that sludge will be especially challenging to navigate. There's a little example of this in the context of evictions. Whether people will be evicted from their homes is affected by whether they live near the courthouse. And that's because the, um, the difficulty of getting to a courthouse is a form of sludge that people have a hard time navigating. That is highly suggestive, that sludge can be a wall between people and something that can make their lives go better. Many nations, as the remarks 
have made clear have conducted sludge audits. In the United States, we find uh, many billions, approximately 10 hours and paperwork burdens imposed on people. This can be disaggregated across agencies. Of course, the upshot of learning about the existence of sludge and the magnitude of sludge is that we can have some understanding of what to do next. And nations that have conducted sludge audits have found for sludge reduction in the area in the area of agricultural productivity, in the area of health, safety, and the environment. My hope is that the occasion of this remark of this session, this remark session, this inspiring session, will be to motivate all of us to do something to give people more, more of what we are luckiest, all of us who are on the planet lucky is to have, which is a four-letter word, time. If we can find a way to have one initiative in the coming weeks, at least to get people more of that, that would be uh something to be grateful for. I thank you for your indulgence and I thank you with me with uh, imperfect technology. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sunstein, and thank you for indulging us with the imperfect te technology. Uh, I think we all gained a lot from your presentation and uh, continue to be inspired uh, by what you said. Finally, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Dave Trudinger. He's the director of the Behavioral Insights Unit at the New South Wales Department of Customer Service, and he'll be providing us with closing remarks and, uh, and ending the session today. Thank you, Harrison, and thank you so much, uh, Cass. That was a wonderful presentation. My task for you now is, is really to amplify some key actions, as Cass said, that you really cannot leave today without committing to some further action. So firstly, though, let me thank all the collaborators who produced this really important publication in New South Wales, Australia, Stephen, Alex, Eva, at the OECD, Prad Nair, Harris, Kiara, and a host of others in the OECD team. I also want to thank all of the International Sludge Academy countries and the OECD BI network. Fantastic collaboration and more to come. So the actions. Firstly, as Gillian said at the start and on the right-hand side of, of this slide, public consultation on the human-centred public administration services recommendation is open until the 7th of July. Please consider that publication and consider making a contribution to that public consultation. Secondly, most importantly, download and read this publication. It's both directional and exploratory. The Fixing Frictions publication is directional in that it gives you nine good practice principles to help you assess, plan, and do a sludge audit. And in taking action, clearly you're going to be part of this amazing movement around sludge and burden reduction. Thirdly, when you read the publication, also think about its exploratory value. It asks you to engage, to reflect, to conduct research, and by all means disagree with the propositions that you will see in the publication and tell us about it. Finally, if you're, if you're joining us from a government department around the world, please consider also finding out, as Harris mentioned, about the next International Sludge Academy that the OECD and New South Wales will be running. You've heard some of the testimonials. Please email the address there or direct message one of us. We'd love you to participate or, or contemplate participating in. My last thought, a colleague um, of, me, of mine said to me the other day that measurement does not generate magic. And I thought that was really interesting. What I took to mean from it is, yes, do sludge audits and don't stop there. Your action in response to audits, as Eva, Mariam, and Claret and the other speakers showed, your action in response is what's going to create better services, better government, better outcomes, and a better world. So please, download that publication, read it, and start your sludge audit tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, and thank you for everyone uh, who is attending here in person and online. Um... That's that's all from us. Thank you very much.